Amber, welcome her on board and uh, giving her a chance to get her feet on the ground. And I have been moved to a position of database administrator and application development. And in that uh, job description, I also administer the software portion of the servers. We have a system administrator, a senior management guard who uh, takes care of the hardware and the power and the backups and the networking and all that. So I concentrate on the software side of the, of the servers. And I took over uh, several assorted different ages of Red Hat and um, SIFSI Linux uh, servers. And we had just a horrendous problem with uh, knowing what was going on <coughs> on these servers, getting updates installed without breaking everything that, um, that, that we already currently had running on them and just generally being able to, to have time to do anything other than deal with the servers. And um, it was about the time that I was coming into this position that Ubuntu really grew up, really became very mature. And the, the real question, though, comes down to who would you rather have running your servers? Well, no, this guy. The other gentleman here is a guy by the name of Mark Shuttlesworth. If you don't know Mark Shellsworth, uh, you should, should read up a little bit on him. He is from South Africa. He started a company called Canonical. And he gives away their main product. He took a, um, uh, a, the distribution of, of Linux, the Debian Linux, and basically made it accessible to, to ordinary mortals. I am not a Linux geek. In fact, until about two weeks ago, until I was actually prepping this um, uh, this talk and, and figuring out how to pronounce canonical, that I also got it right that it's not uh, Debian, it's Debian. So that's, uh, that's really just how little of a geek I am and how little I speak to other people about this. But this is truly an, a, a simplistic, solid, uh, very mature distribution of Linux. It comes in several flavors, and it uh, there's a desktop version, there is a server version, and then there is some uh, kind of some specialty offshoot versions, and Cape Bone 2, Media Bone 2, uh, but all these little spin-off projects that are all tied back. And in the end, the entire thing is tied back to Debian, but they don't wait for, for Debian to, to get things right. They make it right right off the bat. Um, I have here a whole series of slides on how to actually install this. It looks amazingly like installing Windows 95 or you know, anything beyond that. Um, and I can actually skip all this, or we can actually skip through these, because in, during some of these installation steps, I can point out some of the um, interesting features, or we can skip right past it. Shall I go, go quickly through it? Quickly through it. Yeah. I mean, one of the of our, our viewing audience too. <laughs> you know that the recorded on for posterity. Yes. Um, one of the, this is how this is how non-confusing this is. Is that one of the most confusing things is it comes up right off the bat and asks you the language. This is the language for the install. That's the very first thing you get when you pop the CD in. Basically, what you're doing. Oh, I skip this guy. Okay. You're going to go to the Ubuntu.com website. You're going to download a, a, uh, an ISO file, a CD image. You're going to burn it to a CD. How you do that is beyond my scope of doing here, but any decent CD burning software will burn an ISO disk. You pop that disk into basically any uh, you know, PC hardware, boot off of it, and you come up with this screen right here. At this point, you're going to end up with, with several choices. And uh, one of them is that you can put in, that's almost impossible to read. Um, the first option, I'll just read this, these off to you. The first option is the, the install the Ubuntu server, which is what I ended up doing here. But you can also uh, install the Ubuntu Enterprise Cloud. They actually bundle a, a piece of cloud software with it, I believe it's called Eucalyptus. And you could even build. Uh, on your server, off this software, absolutely free, a pretty respectable uh, cloud virtualization system that's mostly compatible with the Amazon uh, cloud so that you can develop projects in this, pop them over, move to the Amazon cloud. Uh, there's a check disk for defects, test the memory, uh, and 
boot from the first hard drive and uh, restore a broken system. And I have no idea what that does because I've never seen a system that was broken. Not that it can't happen. They then ask you, this is what I was talking about confusing. They ask you for the language again. This is the actual language of the installation, not the installation program. This is the, your final system. It, by the way, so far through the system, there's hidden defaults. Uh, we go through where are you located? Do you want to um, uh, do you want to detect your keyboard? Do you want to use a standard keyboard? Once again, default, default, default. This is all keyboard stuff. Now it's the first time you actually have to do something other than defaults. And you give it a name. On our campus, when I put in Ubuntu, and I was installing this with uh, with the network port attached, basically through to the <coughs> system network, to the uh, university's network, it gave me the domain name off the campus uh, DNS system of ubuntu.gsu.edu. Uh, you know, talk to your network people about that. Um, time zone, you know, you pick your time zone, pretty much down the, down the standard stuff. Partitioning the disk, it has a, a built-in uh, disk partitioner. It will set up your partitions for you. Uh, there's this thing called the Logical Volume Manager. I don't really understand it that well, but it's a really good idea, especially if you think you're going to add another disk to the system. It's no overhead for you to do it, so you just pick the LVM. You want to give it the whole disk. And if you have some reasons to do otherwise, you'll probably know about that. You want to reserve some, some disk for something else. Uh, and we, right here, I have to select yes. It's the second time I've had to do something other than pick the defaults as I've gone through. At this point, I do actually want to write the changes and configure it. Um, and how much space do I want to give it? Which was the whole hard drive space we had here. And this is all done, by the way, on, on this laptop in a virtual box. In case you've uh, noticed this frame up here and the, the bar at the bottom. I actually did this while I was installing it on the virtual machine here, and it still took me less than an hour to install this, even stopping and taking all these screenshots. Had I not been taking screenshots, I probably could have done it in well under a half hour. Um, and then you're going to put in the name of a, of a user. Ubuntu does not normally make the root account and all Linux installations have a root account which is really dangerous to use because root can do anything to your computer system. Um, instead, they don't, they don't make root a login account, but they make this account here one that can sudo or run as root privileges. I'll come back to that in a moment. Uh, this right here is, is uh, the, the beauty of Debian that Ubuntu uh, inherited that I think makes it superior to any other uh, uh, distribution of Linux out there is that they have really great repositories. Repositories are sites, databases that allow you to download software and to download updates. And for the most part, you don't even really need to know how a repository works. You do need to figure out, if you want to install a particular piece of software, what repository you have to have installed in your system. I'll show you that in a moment, because Webmin, the control panel, is not in the default repository. So I'm actually going to have to add a repository by editing this one file and rebooting the system. Um, this is where you pick your updates. Generally speaking, uh, you want to have it install uh, security updates. There is a system, if you had a, a whole bunch of Ubuntu servers, if you wanted to set up you know, a server farm of 20 or 30 of these, they have this service called Landscape. Don't know much about it, but it is basically a way that you can check up and, and monitor. And uh, it's, a, it's, it's a service, a paid service from Canonical uh, that allows you to manage a huge number of Ubuntu servers. Uh, very easily from a central location. But anyway, I, I told it to install security updates automatically. Um, I've just not seen these updates break anything. It's just very safe to do. At this point, you get to say what kind of a server you're setting up. Uh, once again, screenshot is a little hard to read on the, uh, the options, but DNS server, and, and you know, if you had the need for any of these, you would, you would uh, once again, you know what you are, or at least you can also go online and, and very easily 
research what services are given here. Uh, but a DNS server, we're, I've selected LAMP server, which is Linux, Apache, MySQL, PHP, or Perl. Uh, mail server, this, you also set this up as a print server, file server, uh, all sorts of things. The Tomcat Java server, which uh, I've been playing around with lately, it works, works really well. There's several other options here, but you can just, just basically tick, tick these off and it will install the appropriate patch, patch, packages to do that. So on our utility server, um, we also have mail service on it because it will send and receive mail. But on our main web server, we don't receive send and receive mail, so we would not check off the mail server. If you don't, if you're not going to use the service, just so you don't have to keep track of it, don't keep don't keep that where firewall and all that. Just don't turn the service on. <coughs> At this point, um, MySQL because I was putting in a LAMP server, it requires MySQL. So some of these servers will ask you for some information basically on what services are being put in. So in this case, we so are putting in a LAMP server. It needed a root password for the MySQL instance. Um, Grub is just basically the boot program. And I don't even know why it even bothers to ask you this. Um, it's a new, new installation in the only operating system. It should have the Grub bootloader. Um, and the installation is complete. It was really pretty much as simple as that. And so at this point, it went through a bunch of gyrations. It loaded all the software on there, and it rebooted, and I came up with a, a boot prompt. Um, so I logged in with the username and password that I gave it earlier during the install process that it asked for. And it came up with the screen. It basically gives you some information about what's going on with the system. Uh, and it does tell you that there are some security so some packages that need to be installed. Uh, <laughs> oh, thank you. I'm just, I'm not paying attention to what's going on. Thank you. That, that does help. Anyway, um, so th this is some basic information that we will, most of this will be able to get, especially this information up here, we'll be able to get once we get into Webman, and the updates we'll be able to install once we get into Webman. So the only thing I really want to do at this point is actually install Webman. This is the only other kind of tech geek thing that you'll have to do on the, on the setup. So it's basically sudo is the command saying allow me to do something as root. Nano is just the editor we use if you know VI or Pico. Well, yeah, Pico's installed. Uh, you're building up a text editor. And we're going to edit this file that's in the etc app folder. It's called sources.list. This is where all the repositories that the system uses are listed here. Um, and you don't have to take notes on this because I'm going to put all these slides online and all these instructions on. So this is what uh, Nano looks like once we pull up and we have the app uh, sources. And we're going to scroll down to the very bottom and I'm going to add a line once again to put this all in line where you can get to it. This, uh, repository that webmen themselves run. They actually run um, a Debian uh, Debian repository. So I added, these, added this little comment, added this line here, dev this address, and then these are just basically um, the, uh, uh, the areas of the repository, the sections of the repository. And I drop out of that, I save that back, and I give the command to install a program. This is the last time you'll see this command. Uh, once again, you have to do it as root, and the command is apt-get install webmin. And so what apt-get is going to do is go look in all the repositories. It's going to find a package called webmin, and it's going to install. And it goes through all this gyrations go by, and it says right here, webmin install complete. You can now log in with HTTPS, Ubuntu, and it installs by default on port 10,000. You can change that as soon as you get into Webman. And that really is, um, that's the entire install. I have a functioning, completely working, ready to go server loaded up with whatever we're going to run on the server, and we're good to go. It was as simple as that. It took very little time to do it. Uh, like I said, less than an hour if, uh, if you were doing it from scratch. So when you log in to Ubuntu 10,000, this is the screen you're going to get. This is the uh, Webman control panel. Now, Ubuntu is just, you know, back up, one little step. 
If you do not know where your web server is, there is one more command that it's interesting to know. And it's this command right here, ifconfig, and it tells me that where my, where my, uh, what my internet address is. Your network administrator may, may want to uh, coordinate on this, whether it's an automatically given one or a statically one. That's, that can all be done in the web and control panel later on. But basically, uh, ifconfig tells you where your, you look for this internet address. And I've actually set that up on this laptop that Ubuntu uh, actually goes to that address. So this is the web main control panel. Um, this is about the only thing I ever use to administer my servers. I drop to the command line maybe once every two or three months. It's just so rare. Um, I have a couple of Perl scripts that I run from, from command line just because I haven't gotten around to, to automating them any other way. And uh, everything else that I do is right through this command this panel. You can also set up webman with additional users that have restricted access. Um, so outside of this information that gives you right here, the basic information about what's going on with the system, uh, and a, a notification if you have packages available. Unfortunately, my virtual machine I have running inside this laptop does not actually have access to the outside world. So I can't really show you a package update, but it's really, you go here, once there are some updates available, there'll be a button that says install these updates. You say install these updates, and basically it goes. Um, you get some basic information about how, how much the server, how hard it's working, how much of your resources are in, in use. So just basic overview of it. Uh, it's a very lightweight system. It uses very little memory. Uh, we're using 50 meg of memory right now. We've got a whole web server, Apache web server, or MySQL database running in there. And we're using 50 megs of memory, um, 1.42 gigs of memory of uh, hard drive space. So tiny, tiny, very, very little uh, information, uh, very, very little uh, resources needed to run this. Webman itself can have uh, all sorts of uh, modules added to it. They have modules for things. For example, if you were to install send mail instead of the, the default mail package that comes with uh, with Ubuntu, which is Postfix. You can go out to webman, uh, webman.com, and I said, I don't have an outside internet address. I can't, uh, I can't actually go to webman and, and show you these. But it would bring up a list of all the modules that are available to install into webman. You know, one of them is a send mail. There's other, other ones that are in different uh, levels of being supported. Um, like they made one for Qmail, but it didn't do much, for example, but nobody really uses Qmail. Everything that's done in here is logged. So if you're trying to figure out what happened to your server at, at a certain time, or what, what could have made something break, um, this is the log of all the actions that I took once I got this set up and going. And they started at the bottom going up. So the first thing I did is I installed the updated packages, set the firewall. I just messed around with the firewall a little bit. Um, the way the firewall comes by default actually is okay, but um, I don't remember what I was trying to do at that point. But I can I could go back in here and look some more. Um, and you can just see basically that I went through and I was playing around with trying to get the network going, not because of Ubuntu or, or any of that, but because of the virtual box that this thing's running in. And so you can see we're here where I came to google.com just to make sure I was connected to the outside world. And then I created a webman user uh, called Earl, and actually all I did was I created it from a Linux user. So we can add users here, but what all I did was actually I converted <coughs> I converted a Unix, uh, Unix version because I'd already created the Earl login account when I did the install. So all I had to do was create the Webman login so I didn't uh, have to worry about uh, logging. If technically, well, anybody who can log into the Linux portion can log into Webman. There are some advantages to having this here because I can now go in and assign all these granular permissions to this user. I can turn off access to any of these modules. Uh, just going to go through these quickly. Boot up and shut down. It's really hard to figure out what's going on with a with a uh, Linux box. What's actually loading it? Boot up. What's not uh, What's not running? 
Uh, do you want to start something manually? These are all the services. Once again, Google is your friend. Um, I'm not going to go through and explain what each one of these does, but, but you know, just as an example, Apache does start on start on uh, boot up. Uh, MySQL should be starting up on boot up. Uh, if I can do them out that now. Um, you know, and Webman starting on, is starts on boot up. You can go into any of these and start and stop them. Uh, you wouldn't want to stop Webman now because you could walk out. But that is the capability. One useful thing here is with the firewall, which is called IP tables. He says, I'll just start it up here. Maybe it's in a separate location. Uh, I know where that is. I'll, I'll, be, I'll get to that in a moment. The, um, when you are playing with the firewall, you, you want to not activate the firewall on boot until you know you've got it right. Because <laughs> you'll boot up and not have access to your server. Um, not fine. Going down through, some of these are, are pretty self-explanatory. Uh, you can actually create mounts if you had another server you wanted to mount a drive <coughs> you know, to create all these different mounts from within. Webman. Um, log file rotation, pretty much automated, but if you did want to have some sort of log files that you wanted to keep uh, more versions of, you can go, for example, here, these, these are all the Apache logs, we're keeping 52 weeks of them, and there's all these options for rotating logs. Makes it so super simple, because the log rotate syntax is just not that simple. Um, you can see what's actually running at this point and how much memory it's taking up. And right now, Webman's the, the biggest, the biggest uh, CPU hog at the moment. MySQL is active as well. Scheduling cron jobs. Uh, once again, remembering the cron job uh, syntax is very difficult. Like when we installed our, our help desk system, they said in the instructions of the help desk system, you need to have a cron job every five minutes to check the mailbox to see if anybody's emailed something to the help desk. So it was very easy to go in here and um, create a new scheduled cron job. And all I had to do was basically say who I wanted to execute it as. And uh, that's, the, that's the Apache user. And put in the command that they told me, the people that wrote the help desk software, put that command in right there. And, and basically told them how often I wanted to do it. So I selected every five minutes. And went through it, I don't to talk to you. But uh, went through and, and told it to go and check the mail every time. Save it as a crime job, boom, it's, it's running. Uh, going in and modifying the existing ones is, is uh, pretty much the same way. This is uh, what we saw from the home page, the updates. But it's supposed to install something new. Uh, you can actually go search the app, get repositories. So, for example, um, I discovered when I was setting this up that I did not have installed in the system an unzip program. So, I was uh, Webman has the ability to upload a zip file and automatically unzip it, and it would upload it and say, "Can't unzip." Gave me a message. And so, uh, if I were connected to the internet with this uh, server, I would be able to go in. Uh, and very quickly install the unzip program. Uh, all the manual pages that are available if you're trying to figure out how to get something done, you can access them here. System logs is one that, that I spend a lot of time on because I'm just that kind of person. But um, you can go in and view the logs and you can actually um, search the logs. Do a grep, they call it. And uh, so if you want to find out how many times somebody from a particular IP address hit your server, you can go and put that in. You can pull up 20, 30,000 lines. It, actually, most web browsers will take that. And it'll search through all the logs and spit that out and give you a nice, fairly easy to read display of the, of the system log. There's also a lot of these others that you may poke around with when people log in. Um, and unfortunately, it shows when all the crime jobs logged in as well. But you can see here that I logged in 
uh, from the local host at 8.48 this morning. Give you some idea what's going on in your system. Servers, Apache web servers, if you've ever done any Apache uh, web server configuration, all the, it, you can go in and just edit config files like this, which I do a lot more than I probably should, but you can also go right in and pull up and have a fill in the blank form for all of the Apache web um, options. So if you're, if you're having to administer an Apache web server, which is one of the main reasons for running the system, is to go in and, and activate modules. So we have um, certain modules that, so you, you have a piece of software that needs a particular module. Uh, one of the big ones would be, uh, not installed, uh, would be, say, it's not one of the image programs like Image Magic. You can install Image Magic, it'll install the Apache module, and then you can come in here and activate it. There's a separate program called Virtual Man, that, and there's an, a, yet another one called User Man, if you were going to be giving out uh, Apache accounts to people, to end users, so you're going to say you're a little hosting company, so to speak, and you wanted to allow end users to log into your server, you could actually log in, you could give them a, a webman login and reduce their privileges in, or even better, is to install Userman. Installs pretty much the same way. I should take that back. You can install Userman uh, from within webman configuration right in there. Uh, virtual man can be installed pretty much the way that you, that you saw me install uh, webman in the first place. Virtual man makes it easier if you're going to have a lot of different websites on your server and, and you want each of those websites to have its own email, its own database, or any of the other services that, that may be uh, like DNS services on your system. Uh, you'd probably want to install Virtual Man. For most applications, you don't even have basically one service running on this server, and uh, or perhaps a second or a third, but just web servers. So this would be very adequate for just setting up a separate website, um, say a subdomain. You've got you know faculty.law.whatever edu, and you want to have you know staff.law. You could set that up right in here. And um, it works. It works fairly well to, to set up, like I said, for very simple uh, additional configurations. Um, we can come back if anybody has any specific questions about Apache web services. We'll come back to that. MySQL, very rudimentary MySQL um, management system. You would not want to use this for day-to-day -day data management. But for just going in and seeing what is going on, um, I had a question. Uh, someone put in a service ticket this last week while I was out of the office asking uh, if they could have a, a login created for them. And I went to my normal control panel and tried looking them up, which was a control panel that I wrote myself, and I, I, the person didn't come up. And so I was like, if I was at my desk, I would pull up my database manager program and I would log into the database and it's a desktop app that would work, but I didn't have that with me. So this was actually good enough to go in to, to the database and actually pull up a, pull up a, uh, a table here and I was able to do the search. It's very awkward, but I was able to actually do the search in here for uh, on the last name and was able to confirm that they were not uh, listed. And I'm suspecting that um, actually I need to go to view data. At this point, I can now do a search on the table of uh, columns. So it's a very rudimentary but functional MySQL handler. Uh, if you have users, with, if you have mail on the server, it would, uh, this would be set up to actually go in and look at mailboxes. 
if you need, just issue a command as though you were on the command line. And you can see right here, it has my last one where I pinged google.com. And so when I pinged google.com, it gave me back uh, unknown host because I'm not connected to the internet outside. Uh, I've never defined a custom command. So there's a little feature that, that uh, may, may be extremely useful. But this one is, this is a place I spend a lot of time uh, and that's with the, the file manager, the file manager's little Java applet. Comes right in, installed with it already. And it, it's a fairly functional uh, file manager. Not perfect, but it cer certainly beats being at the command line. So this right here is that presentation I just gave you. The presentation that I gave a little earlier is just a web page, website, that I actually created completely on the system. And um, I don't know if I want you to see my HTML. <laughs> this is all hand coded, just, just as an exercise and just seeing if I could do it. And uh, uh, for, for no real good reason at all. But I, the uh, file manager allows you to just go through, find whatever it is you're looking for. It has some search capability, it has editing, it has upload, uh, download, and uh, setting permissions of files. So if we want to know, what permissions are. You don't have to remember all the change mod, blah, blah, blah numbers or change owner. You just do it all right here within the file manager. You don't have to worry about this. So you don't have to, to memorize it. You don't remember all the commands. You don't see a command line. So I can see this file here, how big it is, when it's modified, who has access to it, use of the group or the world, other they call it, um, and who owns it. And to me, I mean, it's, there's, there's obviously some improvements that could be made on it, but this is a, a, a huge jump up from the command line. If, you, if you've ever tried to figure out how to find a file from the command line in Linux, uh, not fun. I mean, it's not rocket science, but it's not fun. And uh, coming in here, you can tell what you want to find, where you want to look, the whole thing. Um, so he said, then we'll sort of skip over. Hopefully, you're not doing a lot of curl. You can set up some status alarms. It has a whole monitoring system built in. And so it was automatically activated for Apache Web Server and MySQL database server. And I can set up to have this thing email me or uh, run some other command um, if something happens on this monitoring. And we can monitor all these different services that are running. Once again, it's just kind of plug and play. And if you don't want to bother loading the the, uh, the entire Java file manager, they give you another little file to put down. This one's kind of useful in that you can upload multiple files at one time. Networking. Uh, the bandwidth monitoring, we've actually had a little problem with it. Um, it's not very tolerant to glitches in the, in the database files, and the bandwidth monitoring files are huge if you have a lot of traffic. Uh, but it, is, it does give you some idea of how much traffic you're getting in and out of your system. I, I'll be honest with you, if you really need to know, talk to your network people, see if they can uh, uh, get it set up on a, on a router. There's a program called MRTG, which you can actually install and run right inside Webman. Uh, as a webman module, MRTG, and it will actually query your router and, and keep track of how much traffic is going up and down. So it's much, a much more reliable way of doing it. But bandwidth monitoring is, uh, is available here. Uh, firewall settings. These are just some standard ones. That I, there's actually some pre-configured firewall settings within webman that you can just pick and, and put in. Uh, but you can also add rules I'm not going to give you a whole, a whole. Um, I'm not qualified to give you a whole tutorial on IP tables and firewalls, but if you have some understanding of that, you can go in here and uh, actually set all the conditions that you want for your firewall, and you then have the firewall rules in such a way that you can actually, as a human being, tell what they set up, what's actually what the firewall is actually doing. Um, and you can also have it log all the, 
the bandwidth monitor I was talking about earlier is you can have it log certain types of packets. Uh, so it certainly is, is the easiest way I've ever seen to, to modify your rules and IP tables, which is really very confusing. We did use a product called Firestarter before. I just was not real fun. I could not quite figure out just what was going on with Firestarter. Sometimes it seems to be doing one thing, sometimes it seems to be another thing. This, um, this works so much better. What I was talking about, about activated boot, I will warn you, if you're going to play around the firewall, right here, activated boot, set it to no. <laughs> because when you find yourself locked out of your server and you're going, okay, <laughs> you go hit the reset button and you're back in because the firewall will be off. You do want to make certain that that's a, a, you know, a test server. If you've got a live server, you obviously want it, the firewall set up at, at uh, uh, to activate it boot, just in case the server reboots and you want your firewall on. Um, the, uh, the the simplicity of this, though, compared to any other option that I know of, this is just not not comparable in any way. Um, NIS client server analysis I have not used network configuration. This is. Uh, Rather important for figuring out what you have set up. This is what's active now on this server. On this server. Uh, we're using a local IP address, uh, and then the loopback is just something that all, all network systems have. And this tells you what you're actually activating at boot. Uh, the IP address from DHCP is actually coming from VirtualBox in this case, uh, which is my test environment. Um, you can go in to the network configuration and set up, and we have to do this each time that we are setting up a new server or changing a server over. And you can go in and change the net mask and all that. Once again, you need a network administrator to, to sort of help you with that. But the nice thing is you don't have to drop to the command line. You can bring your network administrator in, and the two of you all can sit down and scratch your heads to figure out how to get this working. Um, and same thing with DNS server, that sort of thing. Uh, and host addresses, this is where I actually set Ubuntu to be local host. And you can add this if you ever needed to, to experiment around uh, or to redirect certain things. When we were doing server changeover, uh, I was able to come in and I was able to move my database server to one of our servers. I was moving, moving internally before I moved it for the rest of the servers, just by coming in here and telling them that the database server is not where it really is, but it's at the new database server, so I could do my changeover. That's the sort of thing that you would end up doing here. Um, hardware, uh, they do have a single logical volume management, which, as I was mentioned earlier, uh, I don't know why it's such a good idea, but it is. And it allows, I, I, I basically tell you what, what a logical volume does. You take physical hard drives, and probably some of you can maybe explain this better than I can. You take m multiple physical hard drives and make them into one big volume. They look like to, to Linux to be one drive. And it's completely seamless on, on your part. So if you needed to uh, add another drive to a system, it would not be a big deal. Um, partitions, once again. Uh, Print administration. I don't have the. I did not install the print server, but that would be active if it was there. And system time allows you to synchronize your hardware. If you wanted to put in a, uh, uh, if you had a time server to sync to, you can sync that. And put it on schedule. That's just about it, except for um, if you have multiple systems running Webman, you can administer them all from within one instance of Webman. So you log into one instance of Webman, it can log into the other instances and you, and you switch between them. Works rather well, it's a little crazy making if you can't, if you can't keep track of your like, short attention span like me and you can't remember which server you're, you're attached to. Uh, because the, the tab up here still says the one you logged into originally, but the window right here is the, is the other server. Uh, you can figure it out, but it, it's, it, to me, I just open it up another but it does have that capability to cluster multiple webman servers together and, and to, uh, uh, to do cluster jobs. In other words, you can do a job on one and it, it does it on all the servers. Uh, pretty good if you have uh, mirrored servers, servers that are load balancing or mirroring themselves and, and you want to go and do something kind of ad hoc on one of on all of them at the same time. 
Um, that sort of thing works out well. There's also a bunch of unused modules. Uh, Webmin will actually go through and say, oh, you don't have that installed. Good analysis. So these are all the unused modules. Um, once again, all pretty much rudimentary, replace the command line kind of modules, as we've seen before. So I think I've gone on long enough. Um, actually, I've gone on much too long. I, I appreciate everyone hanging in there with me. I'd like to open it to questions. Nobody's all, eyes are quite rolling back in their heads yet, so I appreciate that. Any thoughts, ideas, questions? Can Webman integrate with LDAP, um, or do you need to set the server? We are um, we're implementing LDAP right now. It has a small LDAP module to administer some of the rudimentary portions of LDAP, but you would want to use some other LDAP administration tool for your day-to-day -day administration. As far as login, um, Webmin uses whatever login <coughs> mechanism Linux is using. So you can set up your Linux box. I don't know how to do this. Uh, but you can set up your Linux box so that it uses LDAP for authentication. I think it's the Kerber. Thank you. <laughs> right. Um, unless you had a large number of users, I'm not, or, or just really didn't want to remember another password. I would, I would say, you know, what happens if you're all that system down? You can't get into your server. Uh, I kind of like having the independent, unless there was a really good reason to go otherwise. So who's going to go and install a server? Actually, part of the, part of this. Uh, I'm kind of shooting myself in the foot on this because my boss is going to now, uh, he, he's not here just yet, but I, I'm, I have a feeling he'll watch the, uh, the video and he'll go, oh, I thought his job was hard. <laughs> <laughs> so that's, that's too late. Uh, you can already made me deserve it. And then, and, uh, it, it, the, the, the bottom line is, is that I have gotten to a comfort level that I know what's going on in my servers that I can go through here and I'm not constantly pulling up a Linux command reference card. That's the biggest thing. You do still have to understand how the underlying part works. So for me to say, you know, anybody can administer a, a server might be a little hyperbole. But I think it does get bring it in the range of most mortals. I really do. Any other questions? That my email address is there. Uh, you can go to wall.dsu.edu and actually see a server, a live server that, that, that runs, you know, Ubuntu and Webmin. Um, I think the recording is about to cut off, so maybe. <laughs> but anyway, I'm still willing to take some more questions. Maybe I had some more. Are we supposed to go an hour? You know, I should check that. Well, then we have plenty of time for questions. Is anybody here, uh, anybody here already running Webmin? I'm actually running the commercial version of this. Okay. The right. women, women Pro. Well, no, I'm, I'm running um, CPanel, which is the same thing as Women. Um, CPanel has a lot of the same features. Right. Yeah. Um, I did notice that Women had some uh, a few things that are nicer than Women than CPanel, uh, which, is, which is nice. Ben few users I've been in cPanel. Uh, cPanel to me was always aimed at the end user for setting up your email account, setting up your. So it's more like UserMan, and and UserMan is not as good as cPanel. You would you would find cPanel. Be this is more for the kind of replace the command line syntax. Right. Uh, it's really what this is for. Um, but you could actually run both at the same time. They're not. I don't think they would even fight with each other, and they're yeah, certainly not. not I'm not finding that uh, it, if using Webmin, you know, it's it's. Uh, I can see there to be a much simpler way to administer the server. Sure, and CPanel also comes with some licensing tools, and if you get the like Fantastico as well, right. right? Now, Fantastico will install a lot of packages that would be difficult or impossible to install from Webmin. I don't know if you can install Drupal from Webmin. Uh, just as somebody put a repository, maybe it's there, but Fantastic will install Drupal and just you know, a few more rights. Um, we actually set up some test accounts, and I used a commercial off-campus uh, 
somebody wanted to just play with Drupal. I said, here, 10 minutes, I have a Drupal you can play with. And um, uh, so that's that's a really nice feature that I don't know that, uh, that Webman has, uh, the ability to install all those kind of packages. On the other hand, I did find uh, <coughs> how you can pretty much, you did have to drop and do a, to a fan line for a couple of things, but uh, I was playing around with Alfresco, which is a huge Tomcat server uh, SharePoint clone kind of thing. And I was able to, mostly within Webman, install uh, and administer Alfresco on the Tomcat server and got to a, a, a level of feeling comfortable with it within a couple of hours, which I don't think I could have ever gotten that comfortable in days and days from the command line. Right? Just uh, works, works a whole lot better. Any other questions, thoughts, ideas, what other people are doing? Uh, how this might apply. I wasn't that thorough, was I? Now we're just everybody gone. Okay, no, we can't. Administer. I have another question. Sure. Uh, can it handle RAID administration, or do you still have to rely on the service tools? I think it can monitor them. I don't know that it can. Um, right now, we're using Dell's. Tool. Um, well, Samira, okay. Samira probably, Samira would probably strangle me if I messed with the raid. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> that's his purview, um, and he does use the Dell administration tools. All of our servers are Dell. There is a there is a raid package here. I I don't know. Other than some monitoring, I don't know how much manipulating you could do up the raid. Uh, that would be that's that's beyond that's beyond what yeah. I do. You know, I guess if you have a hardware rate, you probably have to use the Dell one. If you have a software rate, you probably use. That makes sense. That makes sense. We we're running all hardware rates, right? And so, uh, kind of leave it with that. The, the the idea here is is that we we don't have a dedicated system administrator. Samir knows a lot about. I mean, if the, if the hardware is failing or setting up the rates and that sort of thing, he knows he knows how to handle that, and I don't have to get involved with it. He he can come in and get the uh, get the backup software installed, mm -hmm. and then I'll run it in the beginning, uh, and I'll have to do it. Um, but we we have this kind of swap over that left me with a lot of a lot of uh, administration tasks that without Webman I just don't know that I could have handled. And if, if, if you're doing it for the first time, you'd want to get a lens to kind of sit by your side. And, and help you get it all set up right, but then you don't have to have that person on call 24/7 to, to keep your server up. If if you come in and something's working really weird, you can come in here just a couple of clicks, and you can say you know oh, um, reboot the system, and we can just reboot your server. You don't have to drop the command line. You have to uh, remember the command. Is it restart, reboot, whatever. Um, it's right here. Any other thoughts, questions? Yes? Just one thought I had when you were showing the cron screen, just the, the if you ever, the thought that occurred to me, if you ever tried to schedule a task through cron from the command line, that, the graphical user interface for that alone almost makes it work. Yeah, yes, anyone who's had to go through that, and I, I cannot remember it. I, before, before I started using Webman, I constantly had bookmarked or saved copies of Linux commands, and I was constantly going back to them and scanning through them, trying to figure out what I needed to do, and I was Googling it, and I was uh, constantly going through all of that, and you're right, you're right. To, to go in, uh, you know, and, and even just to read what the cron job is doing and figuring it out. Okay, the asterisk there means every minute or every hour or every whatever. Um, and, and here we can see that this is selected. This the, all these jobs are scheduled to run at 6:25 in the morning. And so you just go look at it. Just as simple as that. Anything else? Anyone else? I know this is the very first session of the of the conference, and I know where I was like. I, and I realized I was scheduled for it. So, okay, maybe we need to wait a little later to put in my proposal. <laughs> I don't want to be on the last day. I've actually, I've actually presented the first year. I presented in the last slot. 
So I hope this is a good sign. But uh, I appreciate you all uh, taking the time to listen. I have been really excited about this. I'm just such a big uh, fan of Ubuntu and, and what they're trying to do. Uh, I, I neglected to mention at the beginning what Ubuntu even means. It's a, a, a word from uh, uh, some uh, the Banta dialects from Africa. There's a whole family of them, but uh, Ubuntu basically means uh, this, this idea of community, it takes a community, it's this idea of collective uh, effort, and um, the, the, the collective effort shows up very quickly when you go in. Um, what would be a problem you'd want to solve on a server, or something you want to do as a server? Just a, uh, let's just try Um, so we just we just Google something. I guess I mean obviously you've seen Google before, but the 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 idea of this is to try to get some idea of just how uh, good the, the support that you will get <coughs> for documentation from Ubuntu. And so we have this whole background information about. I don't even know what sudo is. I if that's anything different from sudo, I think it's just exactly the same as sudo. So you're trying to figure out this is secure secure login is what you're going to do. And you get this uh, explanation from the very beginning. You don't assume that you're super geek. There's a super user named root. I mean, how much more fundamental can you get than that? Um, the, the, the Windows equivalent of root is the administrator's group. So they just take you right through the whole thing, the benefits of using sudo. So if you're trying to figure out, well, should I activate my, because you can figure out how to activate the root login account and see you don't have to type sudo all the time. Uh, of course, webmin, incidentally, webmin sudo is 40. Every command that it runs is actually sudo, something or other. So it does it, it, does it completely transparent. It takes you all the way through. the, the uh, the documentation, if you did have to drop to the command line and actually run a pseudo command, the documentation is just fantastic. It's absolutely right down spot on. And uh, you know, even down to the misconceptions. You know, you read something somewhere and you say, well, you know, it's all right here. Absolutely everything you need to know. And then it gives you links to more stuff. So the, the, the documentation for Ubuntu is, I find it better than the documentation for any other system that I've worked with. Certainly, I think, much easier to how to do something in Ubuntu than it is in Windows. Yeah, well, I don't, maybe it's not saying much, but. <laughs> well, if there's no more questions, so once, then twice. Uh, I'll be around uh, the rest of the day and tomorrow, and I'm hopefully going to be here Saturday as well. Um, and uh, I appreciate your attention. Thank you. All right. Thanks for having
you can install all this on the desktop version. Mm -hmm. yeah. 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 Um, yeah. 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 I'm I'm still stuck on Dreamweaver. All you know, all the all the time I was in getting Dreamweaver going. Um, I uh, uh, just can't seem to leave it behind. And I'm still using an old version. I'm still using a five or six year old version of Dreamweaver. So as soon as, as soon as I and I think it will actually run. But there, there is a way to do that, and I'll show you that's not going to hook up my head. I could click in there, it's under administration. Um, there is a way. There is a, what you will do, you can probably set it up as a, uh, as a batch file, as a, as a uh, shell script, which is like, right. as a .sh script, and then you can have that one on the I have the issue with my with my mouse. Uh, it that I have this old Logitech mouse that I love, actually. It's really nice mouse. One view still in the box, and I want the front so, so you know. You know, you just want to get used to a mouse, you know. So, um, but I'm not sure you not recognize it. It's a little small, obscure line. Mm -hmm. So I have, every time I, and I have a USB switch, switch between my Windows and Linux boxes. So every time I switch, I have to go click and run the shell script. It's just, I don't like how the desktop, but mouse comes up with a little I can't get it to stay on your face. I was thinking of showing you all your virtual logs, but I guess I have back up with I have one of those, actually, because there are a couple of legacy applications on Windows, you know, the tax app, so i virtual Windows. Yeah, you can do that. You, you can do that. It actually runs quite well. I have, I have Android and Palm. And um, uh, the actual um, Chrome OS. Oh, you have the Chrome OS on the virtual box? Is that mm -hmm. it? Where, where can you pick up the Chrome OS? I was wanting to. Hey, you, can, you can download it as a virtual box or a VMware image. Most VMware images will actually import into virtual box. And um, I, I, I found it online. That was the first time. Yeah, I saw so it. where can you find it online? That's, uh, the, I mean, you know, other than just, I guess I can Google around for it. It was on Google. Google. It was on Google. I, mean, I didn't know that they weren't had it out yet. So. Yeah. Really? I'd like yeah. to check that out. It's how, how is Chrome OS? Like? Well, it's, 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 it's the Chrome browser. It, that's all it is. It's the Chrome browser. You, you get, that's what you get. I think there's a couple of extra menu items, but it's basically. Well, when you open it, when you load up your computer, you it, basically your, your Chrome browser, browser, and you do your searching almost through, like just as if you were to do the URL box and search through your files that way. That's basically what it does. That's all it is. Uh -huh. Thanks, sir. Appreciate it. Appreciate it. Hey, my name's Tim. Um, I'm gonna. I want to introduce myself because I need to probably ask some questions about this because I'm kind of. Well, my my I'll give you an example. I'll give you a rundown of what I'm coming from, so maybe you can help me with a couple of questions. Um, my law school has a, like I just got hired at this school, St. Mary's University School of Law. It's a new school? I guess. It's not a new school, it's just an unknown school. Okay. Unless you're in South Texas. Okay. Yeah. Which there, I, there, was, I, there was a new law school started recently, I don't know if you're trying to remember, it started about five years ago. But anyway, but anyway so, so, so this has a pretty, politically, there's not like, like the IT department doesn't seem to have a whole lot to do with the library. So I'm basically, and I was asked by my boss to work on our website. Just, Basically, our whole website is administered by the university, and the library almost has no input at all. Right. Um, when I got hired, that was the way it was. Sure. That the library had almost zero input into the website, into, this, into anything to do with like using the network on, you know, not not just sort of what we're also worried about with the web presence, but any any other functionality at all. Like, for example, running a proxy server or something like that. Like our library almost had no input at all. Right. And it's sort of just set up like that, even though there are a couple of IT people who uh, boss wants me to work on, like to, to do up a website. And that, you know, he wants me to do this thing, you know, like, like, oh, hey, do this. And you're like, well, technically, it's a little more difficult than you're expecting, probably. Right. So, anyway, what I've done, I guess what I'm trying to figure out is the best thing I can come up with is I've worked on, made a website um, that's, I probably need to tweak, but it's 
pretty functional, it's pretty basic. I'm using PHP to, to, to write a lot of it. And I, you know, I learn to pick up all this stuff. Right. And stuff. I just got to go, hey, are you doing this? And I'm like, oh, what does this take? So I'm figuring it out. Well, I'm just now getting into figuring out that, okay, well, hosting it, I would like to, I don't know what, what the hosting issues may be, but I know that there's a bit of a conflict between, like, because they already have something that the school does, and they already run their own servers, and so I'm actually looking to saying, hey, why can't the library, our library, just have a server and host some of these things? There, there is some, you know, upfront investment. Uh, and I hope I, you know, hope that, that, that came through in the presentation, but it's not the level of upfront investment you would have to see, make. And that's what, see, that, and that's what I kind of want to find out is like what logistically is it like, like you were just saying there, is it how much of a problem or issue is it? It looks, it is a kind of going to on a virtual box. I've been fucking around with it. I've yeah. downloaded the patch here. I've, got, I've gotten to the point where I have an idea of what I'm doing, but Right. An idea. Yeah. Yeah. Well, the, the nice thing is by by uh, by doing it all in one package, the Ubuntu server uh, package, all the updates are handled automatically, and all of the security stuff is taken care of. Um, it, it, the settings that it comes up with are really good. That's the, the nice thing. Uh, we set up a box, just a default out of the out of the package box, just put it in the end. So we had our security people on the panel, and they had some like, way over power tools that don't seem to be some Windows box. So all the years it came up with new Windows errors, which are not their own focus. Yeah. Uh, so it, you know, they they we did an out of the box install of uh, MySQL uh, out of uh, the LAMP server that's Ubuntu in in uh, virtual man or web man. We put uh, backup software on it, which unfortunately uses port 10,000. So we moved WebMan one port over to port 10,001. And then, uh, and then found it. They found a single security problem. And they found it, and they found it. And uh, every trick they could throw at it, it did it, 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 it budge. Uh, so when I brought on our new utility server last July, about, about a year now, um, we had a mail server. And it had a uh, MySQL up in the outside world because the outside servers are needed. And it has Oracle connectors to connect to the Oracle, the banner Oracle database. It has all this extra stuff added to it. So a lot of it was, you know, literally I was Googling how to do this. Yeah, I, I mean, that's, that, not doing see, that's, that's where I'm, I'm at the point, and I imagine that's where a lot of people are. I'm at the point where, you know, I have a pretty good idea of what kind of investment it would take for us to get things running. but not necessarily the kind of coordination that it would take to get it run. Well, um, like you were talking we had, about your network guys were... Um, well, Samaritan's handled most of that. We have not had to deal with them very much. Um, we had one little glitch, first server we swapped over, um, and we, we were fixed the web in, but it took us a, a few moments of panic, because we actually swapped the wires. Oh. And, uh, and but the, the IP addresses are hard coded, so we changed the IP address. And unfortunately, the net mask, we didn't quite understand. Uh, but once we got it in there, we, we, it took us just a couple of minutes to figure it out, and we were able to get it, get it back on the right way. Uh, so we haven't done that much coordinating with the university people, to be honest. Um, it, um, you know, we, we let our security people pound when they're new. Um, but our, we had an assistant administrator been there for 14 years, and he had put the original web server online along with Professor Wiseman, who's here, uh, who presents here a good bit. Professor Wiseman and James Jones put the very first web presence online for the College of Northern Lake, and they made And there were, there were Linux boxes, and um, James left in, in May of So I started kind of digging in these boxes, these old red hat boxes, and I was in the And we actually got breached. Oh, really? Now, the people that breached us didn't know enough to do it. They just wanted to serve us and some redirect links and stuff. They were just doing some stuff that would make us money. That's a lot of times. But they could have gotten some really embarrassing headline making stuff. Um, and 
And it was just, it was a simple thing of the OSS patch. But that's so. But what? But that's one. It would have went to running it.